I want to I want to talk about Christian living. So this will probably be multiple teachings, but I want to talk about Christian living because I think that it's I think as as believers sometimes we we get saved and and then we we get baptized and we get filled with the Holy Spirit. But then after that we don't really know what to do with our lives. People are kind of stuck there so it becomes like a dead end almost and so it's been on my heart to kind of just talk about what you're supposed to do with your life now that you've given yourself to God because I don't want us to get to a place where we're stuck because a lot of people are and uh, and but before I get into the dynamics of Christian living I don't want to assume that everyone understands um, what it means to be born again. I want to start there. So this is where we're going to start today. So I guess the series will be Christian living life in the spirit. What does it mean to live life in the spirit so that we can understand how we ought to live our lives. And But I want to start with being born again. Because if, if we have an understanding of what that means, then that will help us understand how we ought to live. Okay? Um, a lot of people say, well, you know, I, I'm saved. Or, I believe in Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't say, um, believe in me and you enter into the kingdom, which it is true, but believe in me and then do what? What Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, you must be born, of, born again. Okay? You must be born of water and spirit. So that's in John, uh, that's in John chapter 3. Um, so... Nicodemus is a man of the Pharisees. If you want to turn there, you can. I'm kind of just going to browse over that until I get into the, the main parts of this. Um, but there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. Okay, so an, a Pharisee is a ruler, okay, of the Jewish people. All right, they come from the lineage of Levi. Um, and it says, he came to God by night. And said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher that came from God. So these guys knew who Jesus was. They, they may not have knew him that he was a Messiah, but they knew that he came from God. And he says, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said, verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say to you, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can you be born? How can a man be born when he's old, so Nicodemus is thinking with his natural mind. He's not thinking spiritually, even though he studies the law that came from God, who is a spirit. And he says, uh, Nicodemus said to him, how can he be born when he is old, born again when he's old? And then he says, can he enter again the second time in his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, unless you're born of what? Water and spirit. He cannot enter in that which is born of flesh or that which comes from a human being is a human being. That which is born of the spirit or of God is spirit because God is a spirit. And Jesus makes the same reference to the, uh, the Samaritan woman in the next chapter. She said, our fathers worshiped at this mountain. And you say in Jerusalem, that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So how many people say to you, well, if you don't go to a building, then you're not really going to church. It's not what, this, what is Jesus saying? It doesn't matter what mountain that you go to. Because that's what churches are, they're mountains. People look at them and they're grand. And it's nothing wrong with the building. But this is what we're taught. We're taught that if we don't go to the building, we're not satisfying uh, we're not obeying God. He says, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour comes. And it's already here now. When you shall enter, I'm sorry, when you shall neither in this mountain, when you shall neither in this church, or at this church, or at this place in Jerusalem, worship the Father. He says, you know not what you worship. Meaning you don't know who you're worshiping. He says, for we know what who we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when true worshiper 
shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. So God is not looking at where you're going to church at. Okay? He's not concerned about that as far as a physical building. In fact, when the when the when the when the disciples were talking with Jesus and they walked past the temple and they said, Look at the temple, look at all these, look at the stones and everything. He says, Isn't it beautiful? And Jesus looks at the temple and he says, Listen, the the hour's coming, that this no stone will be left upon another. I'm I'm gonna tear this down. And that's what I believe God is doing in, in this hour. I believe God is creating something new. I believe God is doing something new. Where he has a people that is not concerned about where they are as far as worship. But he has a people where he can dwell in and they can worship him from within, from the spirit and from the truth. That's what God is looking for. This is to scripture. The hour comes and now is when true worshipers, who wants to be a true worshiper? Well, they shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. Doesn't matter if you're going to a church and we're outside here. It has to be from within. Because you can be out here and say, well, I'm out of the church, it must be. No, it has to come from here, from your spirit. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. For God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth so you must be born again you have to be born again and he told him water baptism now water also is not referencing just baptism i believe that the water represents the word of god the bible says in the book of ephesians that we are washed and we are cleansed by the washing of the water by the word okay in ephesians i think chapter 5 it says husbands love your wives as christ loved the church who gave himself for her that he may pres uh, and washing her with the water of the word. So I don't believe that just is talking about water baptism. It means that you have to be cleansed. Jesus said to his disciples, you are clean by the word that I've spoken to you. That's what Jesus said. So the word is a cleanser. So let's talk about being born again for a second. Now we did a teaching uh, a couple months ago that I kind of want to reiterate. And this is going to paint a picture. Now we know in Genesis, uh, let's go to Genesis 127 real quick. Genesis 127. Go to, go to verse 26. Here we go. And God said, let us. Who's he talking? Who's us, guys? The Godhead. What many people today call the Trinity. I like the word Godhead, though. It makes sense. Let us make man in our image. So how did God make us? In his image. Initially, we were in the image of God. How are we in the image of God? How are we in the image of God? We talked about it a couple months ago. How am I made in the image of God? Yeah, but what, what, oh, there you go. So that's what we're gonna talk about. Body, soul, and spirit. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Father, we're made in the image of God, so we also have three components that make us up. So who, who I am, who you see me as, is not really who I am. Who I am is who I am in my heart. The soul part of me. So let's, 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 let me take it back a little bit. So God is a spirit, right? God is a spirit and he produces spiritual things. Now I am natural because he took me from the dust of the ground and he made me human to not only experience both natural things, but spiritual things. He made earth so us man to reign on earth. That's what he says in the book of Hebrews. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you should uh, honor him? And then he says, but you have made him a little lower than the angels, because the angels are in heaven, but you've crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. So that's why God made you. You were made to have dominion over 
everything that God created. That's why, that's why the psalmist says, well, who am I that you would think about making me in your image and putting me over everything that you've made? It's humbling, right? It's very humbling. So, God is a spirit. When he breathed in us, what did he breathe? The breath of life. That's spirit, folks. That's the soul aspect of who you are. That's the soul aspect of who you are. God also has a body. Where's his body? Who's God's body? Boom. People say, well, God don't have a body. Yes, he does. In Christ is the fullness of the Father, of the Godhead bodily. That's the body of God. It's Jesus. And what's the spirit of God? The Holy Ghost. You might say, well, what about a soul? Does God have a soul? Absolutely, God has a soul. Did y'all know God has a soul? I'm going to show you. It's mentioned about four different places. Isaiah 42, verse 1. Zechariah. Let's just go to Isaiah 42. Let's go to the first one real quick. We'll come back to... Uh, we're probably done with Genesis for now. Let's go to Isaiah 42. I want you guys to see that God has a soul. And so, therefore, you can understand... How you were made. Isaiah 42. I think it's 42. There we go. Isaiah 42. He says, Behold my servant, whom I be who, who I uphold, my elect in whom my soul delights. So God has a soul. So although he is a spirit, he has a soul, okay? What is his soul? If you can understand what the soul of God is, then you can understand who your, what your soul is, okay? If you can understand the body of God, then you can understand what you're supposed to do with your body. If you can understand the spirit of God, you can understand the spirit that God has given you. Everything that God made in you is a reflection of him. The only thing that makes us not a reflection anymore is sin. That's what makes us no longer children of God. That's why we have to be born again and cleansed, which I'm moving way ahead. But so God has a soul. It says here that I delight in my servant. I delight my soul delights. So the soul is where you have your delights, your passions, your affections. The soul is where your heart is, not your natural heart and your natural body, but your spiritual heart. It's also where your spiritual mind is. You have a, a natural mind, but your natural mind, it's governed by the spirit of your mind. That's deep within the soul. So the soul is a host for everything that you are. Even the trauma that you've endured when you were a child or the trauma that you endured when you were an adult. Your soul is marked. Your soul is a sponge. That's where your identity is, who you believe you are. Maybe not who God thinks you are, that's, but where, who you believe you are, that's what your soul houses, affections. It's a host for your humanity, your personality, your character, your will, your will, your conscience. It's also where your conscience is. So one thing we have to understand, when God made man in his image and he breathed in man, he breathed in him the breath of life and he became a living soul. And everything that God made when he made it initially was good. But what made man not good? Sin. That's the issue, folks. That's the soul is corrupt now because our forefathers, Adam and Eve, 
all of us came from them. Doesn't matter what nation you're with, black, white, Hispanic, it doesn't matter. You all came from, we all came from Adam and Eve. And because they gave birth to us after their sin, that sin fell upon us. And so now we have to deal with what they started, generational curse. Who breaks generational curse? Jesus, all of them, all of them. It doesn't matter what the curse is or who made the curse. Jesus breaks every curse, okay, through his, that's why we have the gospel. So the soul part of you, when Eve sinned against God and when Adam sinned against God, what God made good in them now became corrupt. Because the wages of sin is, so what is death? The absence of God, that's death folks. It's not just when you die and you're buried. Death is the absence of God. So God removed himself from them. He separated himself and now we have death. That's why God is no longer walking around with us like he did with Adam and Eve. Because he removed himself from our planet because our planet is not corrupt. But he's coming back to clean this up. But he's starting in you. So Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's coming back again, folks, and he's looking for the pure. Those that have been washed, those that have been cleansed and redeemed and that know their God and that look for his coming. That's who he's coming back for. He's not coming back for people that went to church. He's coming back for people that know their God and that know him as their father. That's, that's who he's coming back for. So the soul, since the soul is corrupt and the soul is unclean, God does not dwell in unclean temples, right? We are the temple, or supposed to be. God's not dwelling in anything that's not clean. So he separated himself and he let man take over. And this is where we are today. This is the result of man's strength man's wisdom man's ambition man's will and the bible says the flesh profits nothing this is why the world is in the state that it's in this is why a president will never fix anything he may can make changes and we've had good people in politics but cursed is the man that puts his trust in man that's what the book of Psalms says we should not put our trust in man because that's what God removed himself from the flesh. But God said, I appointed my king upon my holy hill. And that's Jesus. So the soul is corrupt. The soul needs to be cleansed now. And how is the soul cleansed? Well, before I answer that question, not only God, did God give you a soul, he also gave you a spirit because God is spirit, right? Paul says in Romans that the wages of sin is death. So not only did we die, do we die naturally, but we die spiritually. So the spirit part of you is now spiritually dead. It's not alive anymore like it once was because God has removed himself from us. And so the soul remains in a corrupt state and the spirit part of you is dead. And that's the part of you that's, that God made to be a house for himself. That's essentially what it means to be born again. When the Holy Spirit comes and unifies himself with your spirit man. And it becomes one with him. That is what it means essentially to be born again. You receive the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost quickens you, meaning it makes you alive again. It brings new life. So now, and from that spirit, where your spirit is unified with the spirit of God, you ought to live.
The Father is looking for those that worship in spirit, not in the soul. See, one thing about the soul is the soul needs a shepherd. Your body and your soul needs a shepherd. Reason being is because your soul is what, what, is what wants to rule your life. That's the carnal nature of man. It's the soul in its corrupt state. It's the will. My, it's my will. It's my way. It's my strength. It's my ambitions. It's my pursuits. It's my thinking. Forget about what God thinks. Forget about what God says. I'm going to build this tower. I'm going to build this house. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. That's where, that's what comes from the soul. The soul is part of man, the carnal part of man. But the spirit, which is a host for spiritual riches that come from Jesus, that's the part of you that's supposed to shepherd the soul. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. He's telling his soul to bless the Lord. He's instructing his soul to bless the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd, shepherd of the soul. He's the shepherd of our souls, folks. Come to me, all you are weary, laid, hairy, uh, weary, wearied and heavy laden. I'll give you rest for your... It's the soul that's weary. It's the soul that's thirsty. It has no water. All its life, it's been focusing on broken cisterns. It's been trying to drink out of vessels that hold no water. Jesus says, come to me. I am the living water. Those that drink of me shall never thirst again. It's the soul that needs to be quenched. They say, they say Gatorade and Sprite, you know, quench your thirst, but really it's the water of the word. Really, it's the soul, uh, it's the spirit of God. You guys get that? So now that the soul, now that we understand that the soul is corrupt, how do we cleanse it? How does the soul cleanse? The blood. Y'all go to Romans 9. I'm sorry, uh, Hebrews 9. It's the blood. You know, it's what's interesting. Go to Hebrews 9 real quick. But wait, here, listen to this. David, a man after God's own heart. Right? But we know David had that incident. And he had a couple different things. A couple different issues. <laughs> but David was a good man. But one day he was supposed to be at war. The Bible says in the days when kings would go to war, David stayed back. See, he was supposed to be at war with his people, but he stayed back and he relaxed on his couch. And that's what caused him to fall into sin, being out of position. He was supposed to be at war, fighting the good fight, but he'd rather stay home and chill. And then what did he do? He looks out his window and he sees Bathsheba, someone else's wife. And we know the story. He commits a sin, he trespasses, adultery. Sin can be done ignorantly or it can be done knowingly, premeditated. But not only did he sin, he fell into iniquity. See, the difference between sin and iniquity. Sin is when I can ignorantly uh, trespass against God I'm not I'm not necessarily sure about what I'm doing but iniquity is like is when you knowingly sin and you just fall it's a downward it's a downward uh, downward spiral from then so he commits adultery and then what did you do then Uriah the woman's husband comes from home and he's like you know hey man you know uh, he tries to get Uriah to go and lay with his wife because she gets pregnant. And he's like, hey man, go lay with your wife. And he's like, no, I'm not gonna go lay with my wife. I'm supposed to be at war. I'm not going to be seeking out pleasures while the children of God are out here fighting for their lives. And that's a, that's a lesson for all of us. The church is being is under siege and it's gonna to continue to be hostile. And being seeking after the pleasures of this life is not, it's gonna keep, it's gonna, it's gonna lead you into sin, folks. You need to be fighting with the people of God. You need to make sure your priority is to fight with the, with the children of God. 
in this war that we've entered into, spiritual war, not natural. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But David's like, David's just out of his mind. He's not at war, he's supposed to be at war. He tries to get a man to go lay with his wife who wants to be at war. And then when the guy doesn't go, David sends the man on the front line of the army to be killed. And the guy gets killed. That's murder, folks. David will be in prison right now. You'll see David's face on news. Uh, King David, uh, 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 you know, gets into scandal and commits murder. You know, we will be looking at David, the man after God's own heart, like Scott Peterson. Y'all remember Scott Peterson? Killed his wife. Uh, it's another guy out in Colorado. A lot of, lot of husbands killed their wives and killed their kids because of they had a love triangle going on. But David was still a man up the God's own heart. Think about that, though. Think about that. That's why we don't be so quick to judge. You don't be so quick to condemn. Judges, there's nothing wrong with making a distinction. Like, listen, brother, you're wrong. But we don't condemn because you, David, we know who he is. We see his testimony. You see some of these guys that be on, on news, like the guy uh, that killed um, uh, uh, George Floyd. Like, how do you know? How do you know his life? How do you know that he was, he's always been like that? You, how do you know he just didn't get caught up? How do you know? When I saw him get the sentence, I cried. Just looked at his, his life gone. Hope he, hope he comes to Jesus. He can be redeemed. And in fact, he might be redeemed before some of the people that wanted him to be judged. God might say, yeah, come, you gave your life to me in prison. And the one, and, and how do you know George Floyd's in heaven? How do you know? How, what if he's not? And what if this guy goes to heaven? Who, who are we to say? Who are we to say that if God, if George Floyd doesn't go to, didn't go to heaven, but the man that killed him does? Is God unjust? Or did George re reject the, uh, the counsel of God to be saved, but he, this man accepted it? You never know. That's why mercy, mercy and discretion is key to preserve your life. Because how you judge others is how you're gonna be judged. How you judge others is how you're gonna be judged. So David not only commits sin, but he falls into this iniquity. So he, he commits adultery. And not only go to adultery, he, he goes to deception, trying to cover up his, his, his sins. And then, he, and then he becomes a murderer. He would have been in prison. But listen to what David says. Listen to what David says here. I believe it's in Psalms. Purge me with hyssop. It's in Psalms. I think it's Psalm 51. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Fifty-one-seven. Okay. So let's look at this real quick. So after David commits this if we go here, matter of fact, I'm going to read something. It says here, to the chief musician, the Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came to him after he'd gone into Bathsheba. So this is what happened after David committed these, this iniquity. Listen to what he says. He says, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And the thing about hyssop is that hyssop is what the Jews used to... Uh, to sprinkle blood upon uh, to sprinkle blood that would purge the sins of the people for up to a year they would use hyssop and so David had an understanding that he needed blood and not the blood of bulls and goats I'm sure that David had already been through that uh, yearly sacrifice and he probably still felt a need to be purged with blood and not the blood of bulls and goats. You see? So blood is what's going to cleanse or purge the soul. So go to Hebrews 9 real quick. I'm going to show you a couple different things what the blood has power to do. Everybody following me? Okay, good deal, good deal. on Hebrews 9 real quick.
So he says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be white as snow. Let me ask you a question. When you've sinned against God, or when you uh, committed iniquity, remember what I said about iniquity, it's the, it's the downward spiral of your life. Did you recognize your need for blood? Did you recognize your need for God? David recognized it. And this is what I believe essentially is what the heart of, is why David was a man after God's heart. This is what I, what, this is what I think essentially what it means. Because he understood where his salvation would come from. He understood, Trevor. He knew that he needed to come to God to be cleansed. So although he committed this great act, adultery, deception, covetousness, covet another man's wife, that's the law. You break the law, you die. Yeah. Adultery, murder. He knew where he needed to go. And he knew that he needed blood. He had a revelation. Brother, what's up, man? You know, all right? He knew that he had he needed blood, man. So Hebrews 9. I'm gonna go down to uh let's go to let's go to verse 11. Let's start with verse 11. Now hopefully I'm stirring up something in you. If there's any any sin in anyone's life, any iniquity in our lives, listen, folks, you can come. You can say like David, purge me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. You can go to God. You can be cleansed. And remember, I, I do want to reinforce, we are talking about the soul here. So watch this, the soul being cleansed. So verse, uh, did I say 11? But Christ being becoming a high priest of good things to come right he's talking about the correlation between the high priest and the temple in the old testament and the high priest that we now have jesus christ he's the high priest of good things to come what's the good things that are coming the bible says i has not seen nor has ear heard of the things that god has for those that love him but it says the spirit of god searches these things and you can know. See, in the law, their high priest didn't give them any hope. You break the law, you die. That's why they were so brutal to the woman at the well. That's why they were so brutal to the woman caught in adultery. That's why they were so brutal to the to the people working on the Sabbath, Jesus, and they were they didn't care about the people, they cared about the law. They gave people no hope law didn't give any hope all it did was foreshadow where the hope would come from and where's that that's through Jesus all thing the law brought was death but the law is still good it's us who couldn't keep it understand when we're in heaven everybody's gonna keep the law you're not gonna be up there sinning it's going to be a pure place there's gonna be no sin and neither will the wicked dwell there anymore There'll be no men who want to collect rent, and if you don't collect rent, they're gonna kick you out of the house. Like, no, my, my rent's paid forever. I got a mansion now, and I have a people that love God, and I have food always, and I can always drink from the food. God bless you. I can always drink. And there's so much more. There's so much more that God has for us. Listen, I'm not gonna get into that, but Christ is a high priest of good things to come. That's a hope right there, folks. By, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. And this is another thing I wanna talk about real quick. The tabernacle that they had in the past was earthly, but Jesus came to be a tabernacle for the Father, and he made us to be a tabernacle for himself. So even Jesus got rid of the old. And we talked about the temples and where you go to church, and if you go to a building, even Jesus got rid of it. That wasn't Jesus's way of living. Again, there's nothing wrong with going to a building, but we've been taught things that we need to unlearn. We've been suppressed and oppressed by leaders who just want to make the house full and gather in the money. 
and make and glorify themselves and have big houses off of you. That's what they, a lot of them, not all of them, not all of them, but a lot of them. So, a more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Y'all say, not of this building. Not of this building. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by what? His own blood, he entered in once into the holy place. Obtain, having obtained eternal, eternal redemption for us. That's what Jesus did. But then it says, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies them to the purifying of the flesh. So what I'll explain that, what it basically means that they were sprinkled with blood. It did, they were unclean. But what it did, it did purify their flesh. It sanctified their flesh. But it never reached to the soul. It never reached to the soul. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge what? Your conscience. Okay. From dead works to serve the living God. So the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of bulls and goats, purges the flesh, it sanctifies the flesh. But the blood of Jesus, what does it purge? The conscience. Where's the conscience? It's in your soul. And what does it purge your conscience from? Dead works. It reaches. Spiritual things can only reach spiritual things. The blood of Jesus Christ is very spiritual, folks, because he's God. And he offered himself by what? The eternal spirit. Meaning that it covered both those things that were after him and those things that were before him because he's outside of time. If this is time, this is time and everyone that has ever lived is in time, Jesus, all right, let's say I'm Jesus, I'm offering myself, when he gave himself, it covered everything in there. Because he's outside of time. He's not held by time. Time cannot be comprehended by eternity, okay? So it covers all and it reaches to the soul. This is what David understood. So, the, so the, the soul part of you that was corrupted because of sin, that was corrupted because of trauma, because you know a lot of people do the things they do because of trauma. So a lot of times it's not their fault. Some of the addictions that they have, or some of the lifestyles that they live, a lot of times people were done wrong when they were kids and they grow up and they live a certain lifestyle and it's because their soul was marked. But the blood of Jesus, it covers it all. Anything that we've been through in life, it covers it. And what does it do? It purges the conscience from dead works. What is dead works? Somebody, Daniel, you remember what dead works is? Huh? Stuff that we do to please God that doesn't please God. That's dead works. So like the religious leaders, they were honoring the Sabbath and they were honoring all these things, but their hearts were wicked towards the people. It's dead works. They're trying to appease their conscience, essentially. Their moral compass that tells them this is right and this is wrong. There's a lot of Hollywood people, they try to appease their conscience. All of the sins and things that they've done with their life, and what they do, they go out and give to the homeless because they're trying to shut something up inside of them that makes them feel good. Well, God would accept me now because you know, I just gave 200 PlayStations to some kids down in uh, uh, Atlanta, but I make music that defiles the same kids that I'm trying to bless, you know, or whatever you do. You try to go to church and appease God. There's a guy that I know that he will party all weekend and say, well, I got to go to church Sunday because I got to repent. But he does it every week. That's dead works. You're not going to please God that way. But what does the blood do? And again, we talked about it before. It gets to the it gets to the conscience, the part of you where you know you're wrong, and you don't know what to do about it. Paul talks about it in Romans seven. He's like, man, I actually wanted to serve God, but then I found that there's another law in my members, working death against me. So now I've realized though that it's not me that's doing this because I want to serve God. 
What is it that's working in me? Sin. And who breaks the curse of sin? Practice of it. Jesus. Through the blood. This is why the gospel is so important. And this is why it's not being taught. Because the devil doesn't want you free. He wants your Christianity to be a life based on biblical principles. Just trying to apply scripture to your life to make your life a little bit better for you. That's what Christianity is, at least in the West. In other cities, these people out here dying for Jesus. These people walk into church, miles to church. They kids, they got babies strapped on their back. They walk into church in the hot sun. Um, Derek Prince, a guy I like to listen to, I truly recommend him. He was talking about how uh, he was at a, at, a, at a congregation and he was and he was and he said something about uh, the congregation he was in another country and the guy was talking to him and he was saying yeah during during the summertime he said how do you guys it gets so hot here how do you guys you know like like make it cool he said we don't we just we just we some people have walked you know all these miles they want to be here he said what do you do about the winter he said well we put blankets over everyone's heads you know to 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 to, to warm the people but the people still show up here we gotta have AC. We gotta have a water fountain, and there's nothing wrong with that. But folks, somebody sacrificing more just to be just to be with God, and we was like, oh well, it's gonna be too hot. And no one has said that, right? No one said that. So we're not, I'm not talking about anybody. I'm just saying. But it is summertime. It's gonna be hot, man. You know, I don't know. You know. What if there was no trees? You know, what if that what if what if it was 99? I'm not saying we gotta die. Like, I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying, you know? What are we willing? Like, do we want it or do we not? You know, it's not a competition with us and those in the East, but man, our brothers and sisters out there, they sacrifice some more. We're talking about AC. You know, so the blood of Jesus, it purges the conscience. Let me ask you a question real quick. How many of you still have guilt conscience of sin? How many of you still feel guilty for your past sins? And don't raise your hand. Actually, you can. We can pray. I don't I want you to feel ashamed. If you do, this is how I know that I'm saved. One aspect, because what I, what I, the, 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 the guilt that I used to have for the things that I've done in the past, I don't feel that guilt anymore. My past lifestyle is truly gone. I don't have to repent anymore for that. Now, if I were to feel guilty of something, it's because of something I just did and I need to repent. So it purges of dead works. And then I want you guys to turn Stay in Hebrews. I think we're just going like one chapter, a couple, or maybe one chapter over. I think. Over here next. Let's go to Hebrews. Ten. So, if you got that down, the last one was you've been uh, your conscience has been purged from dead works. And then the second one I kind of already talked about. I'm going to read it. It says, "For the law having a shadow of good things to come." and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year talking about the sacrifices that they made under the law continually make the comers there too perfect why was that because they had to offer year by year and it did not reach into the depths of who they are it did not reach into the uh, the aspect of them that is spiritual the the, the the soul aspect of you and it says here because the worshipers once purged would have had no more conscience of sin, of past sins. So that's the second aspect of it right there. The conscience has been purged of dead works. 
the conscience has been purged of sin. It's been cleansed. And what agent did it? The, word, uh, the blood. It's the blood, folks. It reaches. You should, if for anyone that has accepted Christ, truly, you should have that fruit in your life where you're no longer how many are still trying to please God by your works because that's also a snare it's nothing wrong with your works pleasing God God takes delight in our works pleasing him but when you do something premeditated in order to please God to, to, to quiet your conscience. That's the aspect that we're talking about. I'm going to do this. I know this. I know God, will, God should accept this. That's not what God wants. He doesn't want you to live your life trying to or being bound to uh, appease him outside of what he's already done and outside of what he has called you to do. Because God does want you to do something things now the bible says that we were a new creature we are a new creation of, in christ born again to do good works so you are called to do something and that's this what this whole series is about but that's what the blood does now so just to reiterate the spirit part of you your spirit because of sin was lying dormant but because of the gospel and you believing the gospel you being baptized you receiving the Holy Spirit after you heard the gospel and believe the blood cleanses you your soul and the Spirit of God comes to dwell in you with your spirit signifying that you are children of God and that's essentially what it means to be born again but that's only one aspect of it there is another part to this and I want to go to the second part real quick Y'all go to uh, First Peter. So, since we're speaking about being born of the Spirit, we have to understand that we're not just referencing okay, the Spirit that God has given us, being united with God's Spirit, but we're also talking about being born of the Word. Being born of the Word. I hope I'm not losing some of you. In John 6, what did Jesus say in John 6, 63? He said, it's the spirit that quickens. That word quickens means to make alive, to resurrect. That's what the word quickens me means. She says, it's the spirit that quickens or it's the spirit that brings life. And he says, the flesh, what does it do? It profits nothing. You guys understand that, right? The flesh, Chris, it profits nothing. There's nothing that you can do out of your own strength to cross over this great divide between you and God. There has to be a ladder. And who's the ladder? Jesus. He says, the flesh profits nothing. And he says, the words that I speak to you though, they are what? Spirit and life. The words, this is the issue that people have. People don't like identifying with the Holy Ghost. They'll jump and shout. They'll speak in tongues. Some of them not really speaking in tongues. Some of them are. But when it comes to the word, that's the part. That's the issue that people have. That's what people start dividing them. Well, I don't believe this. Well, you know, I grew up Baptist. We don't believe this. Or I grew up Pentecostal. We don't believe this. Oh, I'm reformed and we don't believe in the gifts. What does the word say? So you're not only born by the spirit of God, you're born again by the word. So I'm going to show you something. Got to understand that both the spirit and the word of God is both spirit. It meaning it both comes from God. It's spiritual. And what's the word that Jesus spoke to us? What's the, what's the one message that Jesus gave us to be clean and to become born again? 
the gospel. It all, it all goes back to the gospel. It's not word of faith. It's not prosperity. That stuff doesn't give new birth. It's not the law. It's the gospel. And I found it very, very interesting. And it's very sad that most Christians don't know what the gospel is. If someone comes to them and asks them, how do I be saved? They just say, oh, disbelieve. And, there, and it's true. But there's more, we see that as more to it. There's more understanding behind it. God wants you to be able to articulate this thing to those, especially of being his children or his ambassadors. So let's go to first Peter real quick. It all goes back to the gospel. And the enemy has been for since the gospel has gone forth, been trying to twist it, causing divisions over it, and it's very simple. Creating other doctrines that appear to be more important, that appeal to the flesh. Everything's at war with that message. He doesn't want you to get that message because that message breaks every curse that he put on your forefathers and every curse that we abide under when we don't live for God. It breaks the curse. We got to get back to the gospel. First Peter 22. Listen, listen to what Peter says here. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Huh? Uh, I'm sorry. First Peter 1 Peter 1.22. Yeah, my bad. I'm sorry. So I'm still talking about the importance of being born of the word. But I want to touch on this. Listen to what Peter says. Seeing you have purified your souls. What needs to be purified? How do you purify it? By obeying. What? Obeying the truth. Oh, you want to be pure? Don't just hear the word. Obey it. That's what purifies you. How many of us people, there's people that don't believe that they have to obey Jesus. They just believe they have to believe. But Jesus said through the Holy Ghost by Peter, Seeing you, and Peter's speaking to Christians that are already saved. He's not speaking to new converts. Seeing that you have purified your soul in obeying the truth through what? The Spirit. Unto unfeigned love, meaning in loving your brothers, loving your sisters in Christ. In fact, loving your neighbors. You see what obeying the truth does? It cleanses your soul from all of the filth. Because I want to tell you, when I got saved and when you got saved, you were not immediately, you did not immediately become perfect. Am I lying or was you, were you perfect? No, you were cleansed, you were washed, but you, now you have to be perfected. Now you have to be purified. So purification, the process of purification is as long as you live. And it happens when you obey the truth. So what, that's why we have to stay in the word, which we talked about last week. If we don't stay in the word, how are you gonna remain pure? How are you gonna know the truth to obey it, to purify the soul? You see, there's a lot, even the trauma that you've been through, even so the residue, even the residue of, of your past sins or the things that you've done prior or after you got saved, all of those things are still there. The hate that you have towards someone that you can't forgive, it's still, you're still marked if you're still dealing with it. You got to get purified now. The desires that you still have to do things that you used to do, that old man rising up, you got to purify. You have to mature in the spirit and shepherd your soul. Because your soul it wants to stay the way that it is. And your soul wants to lead your life. 
But Peter says, make sure you purify it in obeying the truth. Obeying the truth. Meaning sincere, sincere love, love for one another. another. Not getting mad. I mean, I've seen so much insincere love. I've been treated insincerely by insincere Christians. I still love them though. Jesus, he's pure. Why? Because when he was on the cross, Father, forgive them. Pure. He didn't allow what they've done to mark him, to taint him. See, a lot of the, a lot of the, the damage that's done to your soul is usually done by others that have done you wrong. See, the enemy wants to harbor, wants you to harbor that unforgiveness. He wants you to harbor those thoughts and things that you, that things that someone did to you. Loved ones and church members and all these different things. You see, those that are purifying themselves, those are the ones that can look past and say, brother, sister, I love you. Because they've been purifying themselves with the word of God. And they have sincere love for one another. And not only love for one another, but love for their neighbor. See, and he says, see that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Our love for one another should be deep. It should be like David and uh, Jonathan. That's the love of the church. The church should have for one another. It should be like David and Jonathan. The Bible says that they had love, their love was greater than the love that a man would have for a woman. That's how. But see, you got to be pure. But see, in the church, we're taught so many different things. And people start getting in competition. And, and then there's schisms. And, you know, people want to be in leadership. And all this, this stuff that don't matter. And you trespass against somebody else. Because you think that your calling is more important. Who's to say that the finger is not more important than the head. Who's to say that? This isn't this is not a competition. This one isn't about all oh, I'm gonna do this so I can appear like other people, other ministers. Don't fall into that trap, guys. It's a snare. God has something for you. So love each other with a pure heart, fervently, deeply. Truly, sincerely, y'all should, when y'all go home or this week, go read about the love between David and Jonathan. And it says, being born again, not of corruptible seed. What's the corruptible seed? That's the flesh. But of incorruptible by the word of God. That's the incorruptible seed, folks. Which lives and abides forever. And that word incorruptible means imperishable imperishable what was corrupted soul what cannot be corrupted spirit how we ought to live the spirit so you receive the gospel which is God's word it is spirit you receive the spirit of God which is God's spirit through one message that's the gospel that Christ died for your sins in your place and his blood covers there's no other message that gives us access to this imperishable life this uncorruptible life and then you're born again and this is why John first John listen man this is why first John says this look up um uh, but he cannot sin because he's been born of God. Give me that scripture. I think it's 1 John. Hmm? Yeah, three and nine, right? 
Yeah, that's it. Listen to this scripture. This gives us understanding. What I just explained to you about being born again, this is what this, this is what John is talking about. He that commits sin is of the devil. Very plain. That's everybody that's ever lived. Okay? So nobody needs to feel isolated. We've all committed sin. But the truth is that none of us, a lot of us can accept that because we've sinned, we're of the devil. We still want to be children of God. You can't. You can't. You have to be born again. But then it says, for the devil sins from the beginning. Oh, wait till that passed real quick. Okay. Maybe not. Oh. So it says here, verse 8. I'm going to go to verse 8. It says, he that committed sin is of the devil. Okay? Everybody's in that boat. For the devil sins from the beginning, and Jesus doesn't sin. But then it says, for this purpose, say this, for this purpose, okay, the Son of God was manifested. Okay? That he might destroy the works of the devil. That's why Jesus came, folks, to redeem us from being of the devil and bring us into the liberty of the children of God. And then it says, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Now, people struggle with that passage, but it's simple. Your new man cannot sin. If you follow your soul, your flesh, your carnal nature, of course you will sin. But what's been born inside of you is incorrupted, un incorruptible, imperishable. It cannot sin. That's why in Romans 8, he that is led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You can't sin. Your new nature, because God can't sin. And he's what lives in you. He's what's being birthed in you. You cannot. That's what it means. So if you sin, it's not your new man. It's your old one. That makes sense? It's not hard. And then he says here, In this the children of God are manifest meaning they're clearly seen, and the children of the devil. Here we go. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither is he that doesn't love his brother. Good? Okay, you good? No, you good, man. You see? He that doeth righteousness. So, how should we live our lives? and do righteousness. He that doeth righteousness is of God. That doesn't mean that a man's not gonna make another mistake. But see, I don't wanna give room either. I don't want you to feel like you should make a mistake. Cause you don't have to. You might say, well, I'm carnal, I'm sinful. No, you were. Are you not a new creature? in Christ. So if you sin, it's not because of the Spirit of God. It's because there's still some things in you that need to be purified. That's it. That makes sense? I think that's it. Let me look real quick. I'm going to read Colossians and then that's it. Colossians, it says here, mortify, Colossians 3, verse 5 through 10. Mortify, meaning put to death your members which are upon the earth. And he tells you what your members are. He says fornication, uncleanness, 
inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked in some times when you lived in them. But then he says, now put off all of these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man in his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of the man, of he that created him. And that's where we'll stop. Put on the new man, guys. You have. If you have the spirit, put him on. Meaning walk in him. Because now you have God's desires. Now you have God's heart. Now you have God's mind. Now you have God's perspective. Now you have God's grace. Now you have God's knowledge. Now you have God's will. Now you have God's strength for you to live a completely new life. So if there's anybody that needs prayer, um, I want to pray for some people if you want to be prayed for. Um, if there's anybody that uh, is here that hasn't given their life to Christ, we could do it today. Anybody got any questions? Let's not all speak at once. Um, anybody got any prayer requests?